Hi, this is Harold Long. Welcome to the Hill Tran United Weekly Message and Podcast. I'm glad you're making time for this week's teaching. I will have more to say at the end, but for now, let's dive right in. Our scripture lesson today comes to us from the book of Acts, verses 1 through, I think it's 30. Starting out with Paul on the island of Malta. Once we were safe on shore, we learned that we were on the island of Malta. The people of the island were very kind to us. It was cold and rainy, so they built a fire on the shore to welcome us. As Paul gathered an armful of sticks and was laying him on the fire, a poisonous snake, driven out by the heat, bit him on the hand. The people of the island saw it hanging from his hand and said to each other, A murderer, no doubt. Though he escaped the sea, justice will not permit him to live. But Paul shook off the snake into the fire and was unharmed. The people waited for him to swell up or suddenly drop dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw that he wasn't harmed, they changed their minds and decided he was a god. Near the shore where we landed was an estate belonging to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us and treated us kindly for three days. As it happened, Publius' father was ill with fever and dysentery. Paul went in and prayed for him, and laying his hands on him, he healed him. Then all the other sick people on the island came and were healed. As a result, we were showered with honors, and when the time came to sail, people supplied us with everything we would need for the trip. Paul arrives at Rome. It was three months after the shipwreck that we set sail on another ship that had wintered on the island, an Alexandrian ship with the twin gods as its figurehead. Our first stop was Syracuse, where we stayed three days. From there, we sailed across to Regium. A day later, a south wind began blowing, so the following day we sailed up the coast to Purioli. There we found some believers who invited us to spend a week with them, and so we came to Rome. The brothers and sisters in Rome had heard we were coming, and they came to meet us at the Forum on the Appian Way. Others joined us at the three taverns. When Paul saw them, he was encouraged and thanked God. When we arrived in Rome, Paul was permitted to have his own private lodging, though he was guarded by a soldier. Paul preaches at Rome under guard. Three days after Paul's arrival, he called together the local Jewish leaders. He said to them, Brothers, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Roman government, even though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our ancestors. The Romans tried me and wanted to release me because they found no cause for the death sentence. But when the Jewish leaders protested the decision, I felt it necessary to appeal to Caesar, even though I had no desire to press charges against my own people. I asked you to come here today so we could get acquainted and so I could explain to you that I am bound with his chain because I believe that the hope of Israel, the Messiah, has already come. They replied, we have had no letters from Judea or reports against you from anyone who who has come here. But we want to hear what you believe, for the only thing we know about this movement is that it is denounced everywhere. So a time was set, and on that day a large number of people came to Paul's lodging. He explained and testified about the kingdom of God and tried to persuade them about Jesus from the scriptures. Using the law of Moses and the books of the prophets, he spoke to them from morning until evening. Some were persuaded by the things he said, but others did not believe. And after they had argued back and forth among themselves, they left with this final word from Paul. The Holy Spirit was right when he said to your ancestors through Isaiah the prophet, Go and say to this people, when you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of these people are hardened, and their ears cannot hear, and they have closed their eyes. So their eyes cannot see, and their ears cannot hear, and their hearts cannot understand." And they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. So I want you to know that this salvation from God has also been offered to the Gentiles, and they will accept it. For the next two years, Paul lived in Rome at his own expense. He welcomed all who visited him, boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. And no one tried to stop him. May God bless your hearing, understanding, and application of the scripture. Amen. Good morning, church. Good Good to see everybody. 
Good to be here. If you're watching online or listening on demand, I encourage you to go to the website and pull up bulletins and lesson plans and download today's bulletin. It has some great reflection questions for today's scripture for you to ponder, and also some great quotes on the subject of legacy, impact, if you would. Uh, we're going to conclude our study on the book of Acts. Our study has been called Unstoppable, six-week series going through the book of Acts, uh, really as a momentum builder towards everything we got going on with the uh, relaunch uh, of our church and what that's going to look like and what we need to be engaged in as kingdom people living a Jesus-centered life, and that if we're full of the Holy Spirit, we truly are unstoppable. And that's what we're supposed to be about. So hopefully this series has stimulated you a little bit to really go back and reflect on the people of Acts, the the early disciples, on everything they went through to fulfill what Jesus told them, that you 12 will take this gospel to the ends of the earth. And again, going back to that moment, you had to know that that was a a challenging time for 12 people to be sitting there with no phones, no, no email, no cars, no Ubers, no bus passes, and you're being commissioned to carry this. To the ends of the earth. It takes a lot of faith to live into that. They couldn't do any of it until they were filled with the Holy Spirit, but then they were filled with the Holy Spirit and everything changed. So again, we're talking about a legacy. We're talking about our place in history, which is the title of today's message, Our Place in History. And we're all links in the chain. We're either a weak link or we're a strong link, but we're a link nonetheless. And we want to be a strong link. Your efforts characterize a story, or if you wish, a legacy, your impact on life. And, and for this reason, the message today, again, is titled Our Place in History. So a question, if you passed away today, if today was your last day, and you took your last breath, what would be your legacy? And how would you be remembered? And I'm specifically talking from a kingdom perspective. You know, how would you be remembered from a kingdom perspective? Um, your legacy matters. I want to have some fun for a minute. I'm going to show a slide. This is the, the legacy of an Italian chef. So I want everybody to read this legacy with me, and you have to do it in an Italian voice or it makes literally no sense. So I want everybody to pull out their Italian voice, and let's share this together. So go ahead and pull that up for us, if you would, Peggy. Here we go. On three. One, two, three. He passed away. We can only do so much. His legacy will become piece of history. How sad he ran out of time. Sending all of my prayers to the family. His wife is really upset. She's still not over it. You never saw such a tragedy. Now hopefully your legacy is better than some cheesy statement like that. Last week we shared some humor that... You know, we pray, we came dressed like cheese fans, we took pictures like cheese fans, we had a lot of fun with that. What a great time that was that evening, and the Chiefs won the Super Bowl. How about those Chiefs, right? That was a fun time. It was a fun day. The next day, or a few days later when we had the parade, not so much, but that was a fun time. So we celebrate the Chiefs, the Chiefs won. Today we're celebrating a little Italian chef, so hopefully you get some, eat some good Italian today, maybe for lunch or... Uh, or for dinner. So, uh, I love Italian pizza, so there you go. But last week, we made it through the book of Acts, chapter 16, and we concluded 28 today. And But what about the other 12 chapters? So I want to hit those real quick as we get into the heart of our message today. Chapter 17, Paul is in the church of Thessalonica, and him and Silas ended up in Berrera, and then ultimately in Athens. So they spent a lot of time around the Greece Spreading the good news, you know, spreading the best news ever. In chapter 18, Paul meets Priscilla and Aquila, and Priscilla and Aquila uh, were just, they were tent makers. They were from Italy, they were Italian. The Italian government ran all the Jews out, got to get out of here. Paul hooks up with them. They were tent makers, he's a tent maker. They were entrepreneurial, they had a great time making tents, spreading the gospel together. Beautiful thing. Then the Lord told Paul in a vision. And so Paul had a vision. And so we, we see this throughout the entire book of Acts, where the Lord comes and speaks, but he never gives you the full picture. He just gives you a vision. And, and he even maybe some warning signs or some, or some hope, some encouragement, but never says, 
exactly what's going to happen. But he shows up with Paul in a vision. This is what he says to Paul in chapter 18. Don't be afraid. Speak out. And don't be silent. So basically he's telling Paul, stuff's going to happen. You're going to get scared. Don't freak out. But just do what I'm telling you. Speak out. And don't be silent. Which would be the human tendency if you're afraid just to shut down. Paul returns to Antioch and Syria. And Apollos is instructed at Ephesus. Now, Apollos was this guy who was a Jew who was on fire for Jesus. Although he had some twisted ideas about Jesus, didn't fully know it, he was on fire. When they got there, they kind of amended his ways, got him on the right track, and he became a huge disciple. I mean, he was out there carrying the message and doing amazing things. In chapter 19, Paul ends up in Ephesus. He realizes these people are on fire for Jesus, but they don't know about the Holy Spirit. You know, they're not even preaching anything about the Holy Spirit. They're just preaching about the forgiveness of sins. And so Paul asked them, do you have the Holy Spirit? And they're like, we don't even know what the Holy Spirit is. Nobody's ever taught us about it. And so they, Paul baptizes them in the Holy Spirit. And then they were really on fire. You know, then they took off big time. And there was a lot of writing going back and forth at this point in time between the Jews and the teachings of Paul. Because rumor had it that Paul was teaching all the Gentiles and the Jews, you don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to do all these things that we've done for thousands of years to be saved. And so there was just a large sect of those, that Jewish population was pushing back hard against that. So you got this riot going on. And, but the mayor gets involved and he's like, I don't, he hasn't done anything to any of you people. Hasn't done anything. So it's, I'm done with it. So they moved on. In chapter 20, Paul goes to Macedonia and Greece. He avoids a plot by a, another sect of those Jews who were out to kill him because of his message that they found repulsive. And Paul's final visit to Troas happens. He meets with the Ephesian elders. And then the Holy Spirit warns Paul that jail and suffering lie ahead. So now he gets another vision. So now he's going to get into it a little deeper. Now you're going to suffer a little bit. And this is what you got to lie ahead. So Paul says in chapter 20, verse 25, I now... And now I know that none of you whom I would preach the kingdom will ever see me again. So this is what he's telling this group of people. You're not going to see me anymore. I declare today that I have been faithful. If anyone suffers eternal death, it's not my fault. For I didn't shrink from declaring all that God wants you to know. End quote. So there's a message of eternal separation. One that a lot of people like to water down or just avoid altogether. But there it is in black and white. If anyone suffers eternal, you know, separation, eternal death, it's not my fault. So it's a huge message in, our, in, the, in the gospel that gets watered down a lot in the 21st century, I can promise you. Chapter 21, Paul's journey to Jerusalem. Agabus prophesies the future of Paul. He sees what's going to happen to Paul. So he declares to the people, this is what's going to happen to our brother Paul. And everybody's like, well, don't go. Just stay here with us. And Paul could see the pushback. He could see their weeping. He could see their sincerity. He knew that he was loved by these people. This is what Paul said in chapter 21, verse 13. But he said, why all of this weeping? You are breaking my heart. This is what Paul said. him. I am ready not only to be jailed in Jerusalem, but even die for the sake of the Lord Jesus. When it was clear that we couldn't persuade him, we gave up and said, the Lord will be done. Thy will not mine be done, basically. End quote. And so that's a powerful statement. Paul says, I'm prepared to do this, so don't freak out. Just pray for me, but I'm going. In verse 23, I quote, here's what we want you to do. We have four men here who have completed their vow. Go to them to the temple and join them in the purification ceremony, paying for them to have their heads ritually shaved, then everyone will know that the rumors are all false and that you observe the Jewish laws. In chapter 25, he goes on, as for the Gentile believers, they should do what we already told them in the letter. You remember this from last week. They should abstain from eating food offered to idols, from consuming blood or the meat of strangled animals, and for sexual immorality, end quote. So, there's this civil war going on, but I already mentioned last week, and it's mentioned many times. This is a big strife going on in the Jewish culture between 
what, what's being taught, that you don't have to do all these things. And so we, we see throughout Scripture in the New Testament, especially with Paul, that he's very accommodating. So whatever context he's in, he's going to meet them where they're at. In this case, he's like, for this Jewish tribe, shave their heads. You know, this is what they're used to. Most likely, if you ever watch the History Channel, when they do a, their whole documentary on Jesus, and they give the image of what Jesus looked like, they said he was probably bald. He was a bald guy because that was part of Jesus' rabbi and Jesus' teachers back in, I mean, Old Testament teachers. A lot of, most of them didn't have a shaved head, you know, and so they, Jesus most likely was bald headed. So there you go, Mark, you got it going on. That, that's what Jesus looked like. Just look at Mark. And, uh, but that's what was going on. So he had this strife going on between the Jews and that. And so and, and then for our Gentile friends, they don't need to do any more than what I told you in that letter. And that is, don't eat the food of idols. Don't consume the blood of animals. Why? Because in Old Testament, if you're reading the Leviticus piece that we're going through now, going through the year of the Bible study, some of you are on that study, well, blood represents life. You know, the blood of life. So don't be consuming blood because you're just consuming life. And that, don't do that. And for sexual immorality, which they don't go into detail here, and we're not going to either, but... That, that's a big challenge today in today's culture. What does that even mean, sexual immorality? Paul is arrested. Paul speaks to the crowd in 21 and 22. Paul gives his speech, and he's about ready to be whipped in public just like Jesus was, and he comes out and confesses that he's a Roman citizen, which they have to stop because you don't beat Roman citizens in the public, you know, so the soldiers and all that stop. And Paul goes before the high council, and then while he's held in jail there, he has this another appearance from the Lord. This is chapter 23, verse 11. And I quote, that night the Lord appeared to Paul and said, be encouraged, Paul. Just as you have been my witness to me here in Jerusalem, you must preach the good news in Rome as well. End quote. So he's telling him, you're going to make it to Rome. So this is a, you're, you were definitely going to make it to Rome. When you get there, I need you to continue this message. They plan to kill Paul. Paul knows it. Paul sent to Caesarea, and he appears before the king, or the governor, if you would, Felix. 24, he appears before Festus, and in 25, he appears before Agrippa, and then he, then he appeals to go to Rome to go in front of Caesar, and they grant that, so he's on, he's on, he sails for Rome. They have the shipwreck in 27, the storm at the sea, they have the shipwreck. He ends up on the island of Malta, and this is where we pick up the story where Jane beautifully read for us today. That Paul arrives in Rome, he preaches on a Roman garden for the next two years. He lived in Rome at his own expense. He welcomed all who visited him, boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and a teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ, and no one ever tried to stop him. It's a powerful message. So today, I really want to get into four main points. And again, summarizing what we just went through is, is one of those. And that's after his third missionary journey, Paul returned to Jerusalem. We know that. We read that earlier. And was arrested. After several trials and testifying of Jesus in front of governors and kings, Paul never wavered on it. He made an appeal to go in front of Caesar. As a result, officials transferred Paul to Rome under guard, and as the story of Acts concludes, Paul has been under house arrest for two years. Just as the book of Acts begins with the teaching of the kingdom of God through Jesus himself, it's really important to hear this, Acts ends with this statement. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance, end quote. So you could call the gospel the entire gospel, or the entire New Testament, but definitely the four gospels. The gospel of the kingdom would be another word for it. Because this is what Jesus talked about more than anything, was the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is not of this world. So it's got a separate set of principles and how we live, and we talk about those every week. But it's important to get that. And even though the book of Acts ends, the mission of God and the advancement of the kingdom continues today. That's our calling as kingdom people. And the story is the story we find ourselves in. We are a part of the next chapter. And today we have a vital role in God's kingdom to continue on earth as it is in heaven. So this is our calling. May we never forget that. So there's three main points I want to hit on, really a plus a fourth. 
And number one is we have observed a practical way to advance the kingdom from the book of Acts. So we've been taught through this entire book, through every chapter, how to advance the kingdom. The earlier believers as examples of what redeemed people look like under the rule and reigning king. So they lived as a community. They demonstrated what it meant to live a Jesus-centered life. We are to incarnate the gospel, to make it come alive, be Jesus with skin on. That's our calling in our life. And through our actions, our words, and our attitudes, we're an example, good or bad. Hopefully, we're a great example of what it means to live a Jesus in our life. And think about it. You may be the only example of the Bible, of the New Testament, of the gospel of the kingdom that anybody ever sees. You may be it. You may be the only demonstration of a Christian anybody ever really sees. That's a huge responsibility, the way you carry yourself, whether it's on social media, out in the public, in your workplace, driving down the highway, all of those things. How you carry yourself matters. But we need to proclaim the good news, and we also need to practice the gospel. We need to practice what we preach. The second is that we need to connect, connect with other people, to be very intentional about it. So one, we demonstrate these principles in all of our affairs. Number two, we have to be intentional about it. In his book, What Jesus Started, Steve Addison says this, and I quote, Jesus didn't wait for people to come to him. He walked from village to village looking for people on the road, in the marketplaces, in synagogues, in private homes and public places, by the lake and in the temple, at a wedding feast, at a funeral, at a banquet with sinners, and a meal with Pharisees. Wherever the people were, Jesus went. The good shepherd was looking for lost sheep. End quote. Right? So you can, another way to say it is a good shepherd smells like sheep. Right? Because he's hanging with the sheep. And that's really important. Similarly, if we bring it home contextually, Jesus sends us out in the world to connect with people. As we go throughout our days, our paths cross with all kinds of people. Strangers, those that are hurting, those who need, those who need God. Highlights to you and those within our Relational spheres, if you would, our family, our friends, our co-workers, classmates, club members, and people we know from frequenting the same business places that know you from just repetitive interactions. That's our, that's our community. That's what we're called to do is be alive. There's a great website. It's called The Verge Network, if you're not familiar with it, and a lot of great writings on how to be missional. You know, just tons, tons of great direction ideas for how to be creative in your missional efforts. But one of the pieces there is here are eight ways to be missional. And number one is eat with non-Christians. And what does that mean? Well, that means basically is that, you know, invite people that are necessarily following the Lord to come to your house and break bread with you. Take them out to eat. Hang out with people that don't look like you, walk like you, believe like you, talk like you. Spend time in those places building community walk don't drive is number two so if you can walk to where you're going versus driving then go for a walk and you never know who you're going to meet along the way be a regular kind of like cheers remember that show where everybody knows your name you know be a regular i got my buddy one of the guys i mentor his name's mark i talked to him on wednesday mornings and every time i talked to him eight o'clock in the morning he's going through starbucks every time and they already know who he is is this mark yeah okay they already got his order they already know it's hilarious uh, but yeah, this is what we're talking about. Hobby with non-Christians. What does that mean? It means hang out with people that don't necessarily believe like you do. And quit worrying about what other people are going to think. I hang out with all the outcasts. Believe me, I'm around all the crazy people. I golf with a bunch of old guys. I'm the youngest of the old guys. I call them old guys. But half of them may be Christian, maybe. They may claim that. The other half, I'm not sure. But I hang out with these guys you know, a couple times a month. We go play golf. And it's, it's a ball. It's really a ball because now most of them know I'm a pastor. So when they hit a really bad shot and they hit a cuss word, they immediately turn around and go, sorry, pastor. What do you apologize to me for? You know, maybe we talk talking to the man upstairs. You don't need to apologize to me. It's pretty funny. But that's the point is to go out and be real with people. Talk to your coworkers. Easy not to do. Easy to just go through your space and never want to have any spiritual discussions. But we're encouraged to do that. However, that may come out. Volunteer with nonprofits. We do that a little bit down the road with the Peace Pantry. But there's lots of other places. My mom was a longtime volunteer at Red Cross. She loved that job. She loved to go do that. 
and especially in catastrophic situations. So just lots of opportunities to go out there and work with other people that have a heart for humanity and want to make a difference in the world. Participate in city events, which some of you have done. The band I know has done that and different events around. And serve in your neighborhoods. You know, join the neighborhood association, all that good stuff. These are just ways to be commingling with other people, but at the same time, be intentional about sharing the gospel. Number three is share the gospel. And we witness disciples engaging in conversation all throughout this book of Acts. They're in conversation with people all the time. In love and compassion, we can share our stories and the story of Jesus with others. And remember, we do not do this in our own power, but the power of God. The Holy Spirit is what gives us the power. So if you start dwelling on it, I don't know what to say. I'm not a good speaker. I'm not a good talker. Well, then you've already missed the point. Because then you talk it, it's the Spirit talking through you. So again, the key thing is to get prayed up and pray for be filled with the Holy Spirit all the time. We are Jesus' witnesses to the dark and hurting world, each and every one of us. And it's an illustration. Sharing your personal testimony is the most powerful tool you have. It's your own experience. You, this is what I've seen. This is what I heard. This is what I've experienced. And that's legit. And you need to be able to do that. And I would even have a 60-second version of that. So if you're at the airport, somebody says, you seem like a pretty cheerful guy. What are you so happy about today? You know, you can do your 60-second infomercial, your elevator speech, of why you have joy in your life. And it's, it's, it's important to be able to do that. And so we're called to do that. And finally, is to be on mission. Acts 1 and 8, we saw that right off the bat, what their purpose was to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. Matthew, right, 28, verses 18 and 20. That is the, the Methodist mission statement, the global Methodist mission statement. Make disciples who make disciples for the transformation of the world. But that's our calling. And so we're either doing it or we're not. There's either fruit, and we can look out and we can see the fruit of that, or we're not. And we, if we don't see the fruit, we just don't beat yourself up about it. But it's just how to be intentional. No matter what Paul's circumstances, he always sought to be an ambassador for Christ. Whether he was stranded on an island, he was out on a ship, or he was in jail, he was trying to be an ambassador. And even as the book of Acts closed, he's under house arrest, and he's still a witness for Jesus. Amen? He's still preaching. In summer, we can always represent Jesus to others regardless of our circumstances or our situations. We are to live normally, but think missionarily. We are to think about how I can be missional today. Just go about your usual life, but be led by the Holy Spirit on this missional adventure you go on. And it's wherever you get called to. You might be standing, I mean, I, I, more than once. I can't even tell you how many times I've been at the gas station pumping gas. And I'll see somebody who I know is struggling. They might be sitting in their car, they might be standing there, you can just tell by the look on their life, and you just simply say, hey, I don't know what's going on, but I believe in God, can I pray for you? I guarantee you 90% of the time they'll say, please, please do that. It could be a waitress or a waiter at a restaurant, you could just tell it's having a challenging time. It, 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 that's a call, and you don't have to have some big, long, drawn-out prayer, just to be one sentence, you know? But hey, what's your name? Tony, hey, Tony, let me pray for you. And you pray for him. And you can bless him big time in a big time way. You just never know where that's going to lead. But always on mission, always ready to, to, to act in a, in a mighty way. But we're just to live normally and live normal lives. I want to show a video and just give you an example of what we're going to watch. And then they'll give a website. And I'll send this out later on in the link. I'll give you the link to uh, the Birds Network. But I'll also give you the link to this video I'm going to show because it, they got a free resource in it for being missional. It's really powerful. It's a quick video, but it just shows you a group of people, everyday people, who got it, who finally got what it means to be missional, what it means to be to live out the book of Acts. So let's check it out. Church, you know, model the Austin Stone. I was asked to write an article about a missional church, and to be honest, I actually had never even really heard the term. Just kept telling them, look, I really want to move to Austin. I want to discover what the culture is, and I want to read the Bible. I grew up um, in, a, in a home where church was consistent. We were all about missions, but missions was uh, an offering that we took up. We a lot of times, I mean, 
American churches. Church is something that we do. New Testament believers, churches do what? Well, the church doesn't expect normal, everyday Christians to be in mission in the area of life. I think we've misunderstood the very nature of what it means to be God's people. The more I read about it and the more I spoke to people about it, I found myself really captivated by this idea. It's just basic idea that every single Christian is called to be a missionary in whatever context God has placed them. I remember my dad when I was in high school just really saying, we're going to live on a mission. We're going to live that out. And I got to watch that with them. I was a construction worker. There's a, a school here in town that is a more under resourced neighborhood, more impoverished neighborhood. So we called out to the church and said, hey, let's go be intentional about living on a mission of this project. My dad's been up at 1 or 2 a.m. talking to these guys, shepherding them, if you will. And my dad's, you know, just an everyday normal Christian. We had uh, folks that were teachers in more affluent schools in other parts of the town leave their jobs, move into the neighborhood, and go be teachers in the school. If there'd be a need, we'd bring it to the dinner table and my dad would say, Especially when you want to give up our bedroom, when you really want to give up your room for a season because someone needs a place to live. Hundreds of volunteers came to the school, started the tuition program, and within one year, we uh, saw them pass the standardized test scores in the state of Texas and shut it down. Kid who is not doing well with his family, or someone just got out of prison and needs a place to learn and help get started again. Kind of modeled Jesus. I mean, he, he lived the incarnation, came to us, he put our skin, he lived in our neighborhood. And so I think that's what we try to model is hey, we're not going to come in from from outside and tell you what you can do, but we want to come and live with you and suffer with you and hang out and have with you. And that's what it means to be intentional, right? To live in solidarity with those who are lost. And that's what we're called to do. And every one of you had different gifts and different, you know, God's got different visions for you and plans for you, but everybody here is called. Regardless of what season of life, even if you're a senior and in, in, in your past retirement and you're in there, you're, you know, so-called golden years, there's still a mission for you. What is it? Some of you are already living into a little bit, but, but I mean, publicly, what is it? Where, where can God use me? And that's, that's the beauty. When you really get that, that changes your life. And you don't want to live any other way. And here's the beautiful part of that. God doesn't bring two people together to only bless one of them. So when you're sacrificing and you're going up your time and your talents and your treasures to go out there and be a maximum service to the community that you're in, which is right here, right now, you're going to be blessed by that. And you're going to find that it's really, it fills that hole inside you that nothing in this world will ever fill. Nothing. It's what you were meant to be. And when you really live into it, you, you get that sensation. Um, and it's beautiful. And it's like, wow, this is really what it's about. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. All the time, not just once a year or on occasion, but I should be living this mindset, this missionary mindset all the time. And you will find fulfillment like you never had before. So really encourage you to do that. The prayer is really simple. It's just two words. It's a bold prayer. Use me. I mean, that's the prayer. Use me. God, use me. Despite my self-doubt, despite my insecurities, my this, whatever, my self-judgment. Use me and help me get out of the way of myself. And if you do that and you're sincere about it and you use resources like we just put out today, you'll find ways to get creative and you just pray, Holy Spirit, inspire me. Show me, give me some kind of vision on what's next. What's the next steps for my life? Where am I supposed to be involved? And it'll come to you. Yeah, I don't know what that is, but when you find it, I encourage you to live into it because it's going to be awesome and you're going to bless a lot of people with it. So with that, I'm going to invite us to stand. I'm going to invite the band back up, we're going to pray, and we're going to sing some songs. And we're going to do it with a missionary heart. Amen? Amen. With the reward of a Girl Scout cookie and donut. <laughs> right? So there you go. Have you tried Not yet, but I plan on it. So the doors are locked. You will not be able to leave the sanctuary or the church today. So all cookies are tested. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this wonderful group of people and for those listening online or those listening on demand that fall under the umbrella as a believer that say yes I am following the Jesus looking God I want to live a Jesus centered life to know that we are called to live into that not just some superficial version or wearing a necklace or a cool 
fish symbol on our car, but that you're, we're actually called to, to live a Jesus-centered life in every aspect of our life. And we know in a world that is lost, especially in the wild, wild west, Lord, that that's not easy to do day in and day out. So we're praying to be filled with the Holy Spirit because we know with the Spirit that it's possible. That there's nothing that can stand in our way. There's no gate of hell that can keep the gospel message from coming through it with the power of the Holy Spirit and a willing soul. So we're praying to be humble, to be self-sacrificial, to be other-centered, and to just go out into the community in our everyday life and to love everybody, even the people we just don't care for. But do so in a missionary stance, a missionary commitment to serve, to love and serve the people about us, to share the good news, not just good news, but as we like to say here, the best news ever. Give us the courage to do that. And then let us reciprocate that in our own lives and experience the joy that comes with it because you created us to enjoy you and to enjoy this life, especially if you live it in a Jesus-centered way. So we pray that today, and we pray it boldly in your son's name. Amen. Amen. And this is Harold. Thanks for listening to our weekly message and podcast. I hope that we have shared something helpful to you wherever you are in your spiritual journey. Just so you know a little bit more about us, we are Hill Tran United. Hill Tran United is an alliance between Hillsboro United Methodist Church and Transformation United Methodist Church. We are kingdom churches and kingdom communities for people who aren't into church. We meet Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. at Hillsboro United Methodist Church and 11 a.m. at Transformation United Methodist Church. Both churches are located in the northeastern tip of the beautiful Ozark Mountains, located in Jefferson County, Missouri. We also meet during the week in smaller groups that we call life groups and home churches, and that's how we make it relational. We hear regularly from people from all over who are engaging in personal and group studies based on our teaching, and we would love to know if that is happening where you are at. If you want to connect with us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Vimeo, and YouTube, where you can download our app from your favorite app store. Just search for the app titled Our Church by Church Dev and enter in Hilltran United and you can access all of our available audio, video teachings, plus through the app you can, and our, or our website, you can download our PowerPoint slides, bulletin, sermon notes, and discussion questions. It's all there for you. And lastly, if you want to learn more about how you can support Hillsboro United Methodist Church or Transformation United Methodist Church financially, please go to www.hilltran.org for more information and to give. We appreciate anything you can do to help. Hey, thanks for being a member of this extended church family. I'm glad we are in this together as kingdom people commencing shoulder to shoulder to help people rediscover life and experience the kingdom of God.